Welcome to the Modern Mythos Podcast, a show dedicated to the keepers and players of Call of Cthulhu and other investigative horror games. I'm John Hook. And I'm Seth Skorkowski, and together we'll discuss writing, game mastering, and player tips and how you can apply them to your table. In this episode, we discuss vampires in your Call of Cthulhu game. Vampire, or is it vampire? Well, I, 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 that's the, probably what we're going to discuss. And uh, we had a lot of delays in getting to record this, and I know it's not going to come out the same day, but it just so happens that today is the 36th anniversary of the release of uh, Lost Boys uh, back in 1987. So that was fortuitous. Fortuitous, indeed. That we, uh, we were planning on doing this one. Yeah, there were a lot of great vampire movies like in the eighties and stuff loved lost boys loved near dark. Oh my oh, God, oh God. I love that. Well, you had, you had fright night. Um, yeah. And, what was it? Salem's lot. Stephen King's thing. That happened oh, at the... Just uh, read the book and watched two of the, of the mini series that were produced for that. And they were all great. And you know, one of the things with, with lost boys, the original script, they were supposed to be like 11. Uh, because it was a reference to Peter Pan, because that's why Peter Pan could fly and he could only visit Wendy at night. Oh so, my God! Oh, that's awesome! And uh, some of the character names are actually uh, originally from the the Peter Pan. Is it was it was a it was originally the original script was a very dark Peter Pan, where oh, there were wow. just these murdering little vampires. Yeah. Uh, yeah, of course. Oh my it, God! Changes were, were done. There were really great changes because they brought it. They made them all like, te- you know, upper teens, like you know, eighteen. Yeah. But, uh, but that's why it's called the Lost Boys. Is they had the boys that never grew, would never grow old. Wow! I, I tell you, I that connection went right over my head for all these years. I just figured it was you know Lost Boys because they were you know kids that. Oh, went missing, all the missing, right? You know, they were yeah. the missing and everything. And then, you know, now they're just kind of in the, uh, in the subculture of society and just they're lost to society. I thought that was the more heady interpretation of the, of the movie title. They were lost to the society, not a connection to Peter Pan lore. That is freaking wild. I love it. Oh yeah. I, um, so yeah, yeah. Growing up, all all the great movies, you know, yeah, you know, standing on the shoulders of you know, you know going back to Bela Lugosi's Dracula, or the um, it was not for very long Nosferatu before that, uh, mm-hmm. and all the all the vampire stuff that that came out on on TV, and that I was usually too young to watch, but I did anyway. Uh, you know, vampires, man, popular, popular Super subject, super popular. Yeah. And what a great monster. There's such a cool monster. Well, yeah, unlike everything else, it's, you know, the, the, the Lovecraftian stuff, you know, vampires are in lore. There's different versions from around the world. There is, there is like basically a, a smorgasbord of lore to choose from. And uh, I don't know. I, I think there, yeah, a lot of people say that like, you know, to be Carla Cthulhu, it must be, the, you know, the, the, the mythos. And I, I don't think so. And the first adventure ever written for Call of Cthulhu was uh, the haunting. And Walter Corbett was essentially a vampire. I, he, he wasn't the, the classic vampire, but he was essentially this immortal undead thing that sustained itself through drinking blood. Well, that's, you know, buried in the basement. Um, he, who also yeah, drank kinda. carrots for some yeah. reason, like it says like <laughs> he, he could, he could eat carrots or drink blood, but he just prefers blood. <laughs> if my choice was blood or carrots, I think I would also go blood. Like, like, like Count Duckula, man. I don't know if you ever watched that show, but <laughs> no. like, yeah. So, you know, so the actual first Call of Cthulhu adventure was a vampire, uh, just, you know, a, a little twist to him, but that's, that's what he was. He wasn't a shaga through, you know, anything that Lovecraft came up with, just, just a vampire story. So I, I think that that's, this is one that actually has a lot of potential for, for games at, you know, cause there's so many ways we can do them. 
I agree. And, you know, we we looked around and, and uh, maybe our our Google Foo is not as uh, awesome as we like to think, because. I mean, beyond interpreting Walter Corbett as a vampire, I could only find one. Chaosium published scenario in uh, the Blood Brothers one book that included vampires. And th- that is weird to me because there there are three that I know of that have werewolves, like two of them among the two uh, Blood Brothers uh, that there was uh, the rescue, which is at the uh, what was the original Cthulhu Companion. The vampires, for some reason, despite their massive popularity, there really isn't much. And I, I don't know how much of that became kind of like getting away from like, like the popularity of vampire, the masquerade in the nineties and whatnot. Mm-hmm. But, mm-hmm. Uh, I would have thought you would have made it up with more, but, uh, but vampires, we've got one that we that we're aware of that is a legit vampire. And then we've got Walter Corbett who is essentially a vampire. Yeah. Even though in the, in the haunting text, they, they say that he's a lich, but really a lich is, it's a vampire. It's it's of the vampire family. Yeah, he's 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 a, he's a blood drinking corpse. I mean, what else do you what else do you need to uh, to be a vampire? <laughs> exactly. So. Yeah. How many boxes do you have to tick before uh, you get your vampire card punched? Right. Well, you know that's that's actually one thing we get to talk about is in in Call of Cthulhu there is a skill called you know or lore. It's a, it's one of their specialization skills, and it gives several examples of various lore that a player character could know or specialize in. It starts at 1%. And among the suggestions is a character could have vampire lore. There's like ghost lore and werewolf lore. And they, mm-hmm. and it wasn't just like, uh, like folklore. It was yeah, like, where like, which I would use as like an umbrella term for all of them. It was like very, very specialized. Like I am, I, I dumped 30 points into my knowledge of vampires, you know, sort of thing, which, I don't know. I feel like I've got more than a 1% in my own vampire lore specialization. So, and I, I would agree with that. But then that makes me wonder from a game perspective, is there a difference between having knowledge that you've picked up through pop culture versus having knowledge that you've educated yourself on or, or picked up through intense study? And maybe a skill like lore, vampire in parentheses, you know, uh, as the specialization, maybe there's a difference between having skill points in that versus simply just using a no role. Yeah. And because there's, there is so much pop culture reference to it. Like, uh, you know, sometimes at, at the films, it's like they have reflections. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes the, uh, you know, holy water works. Sometimes it doesn't, uh, you know, sometimes they catch on fire when they're in the sun. Other times they, they sparkle or they just don't have any power. Like in, uh, the, the Bram Stoker's Dracula, he was walking around the daylight. He just couldn't do all this cool vampire stuff. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that, that is a lot of stuff I know, but, but that's, yeah, you know, that's Hollywood vampires. That's not that's not the real vampires that our our investigators would be facing. So, right. Okay. I think that could be an interesting way to present it in game, where especially as the players are are learning more and more about you know they're doing their investigation, they're learning more and more about the the creatures that they may be tracking or potentially going to try and face down. And maybe they're unsure of what it is, but then as they're uncovering all this info and the keeper says, okay, let's add a new skill to your character sheet, write this down. You now have a skill called lore specialization vampire. And now that you've completed your education, you know, your study in the library, once you uh, put down a uh, roll a D three and that'll be your starting percentage or something like that. Right. Uh, and now the, the characters are, you know, that, that light bulb is, beginning to glow in their head as they're you know the dawn of realization of oh my god we're we're facing off against a vampire and they have to sift through what they think they know 
versus what they are learning and know for sure. Yeah. Well, because you can also turn uh, lore specialization is it's the, the folklore version of your Cthulhu mythos skill. Uh, where you know it called Cthulhu, you you if you interact with deep ones or or ghouls or any of that, you know you gain points in in your in your Cthulhu mythos, and then your sanity is is reflected off of that, et cetera, et cetera. But you know, but that's essentially just a, a lore specialization mythos. And if you wanted to say, you know, I wanted to call it Cthulhu, but I actually want to have a lot of uh, different types of things. Then you have, you know, your your vampire lore, your ghost lore, or whatever it is you want to focus on, and that it's it's essentially like a, a mythos, where of, well, because there are a lot of stories, but these are the ones that you know for a fact, or the stuff that you know that isn't in the the popular stories. That uh, it just made me wonder as you were saying that, you know, as you're comparing lore specialization to the Cthulhu mythos skill, you know, having Cthulhu, having points in your Cthulhu mythos, it also reduces your sanity cap. Do you think it would be fair for a lore specialization, especially one where it's pertinent to inhuman monsters, do a reduction on your sanity cap? Well, in... Yeah, in the actual Call of Cthulhu rules, such yeah, you know, they do have, they do have vampires in it. There is a sanity loss for them. D four, they're only worth a D four. Wow, yeah, a zero slash D four. A, a skeleton walking around is worth a zero D six, but a vampire? <laughs> Maybe because it still looks human or potentially human, which again. As we'll get into a little bit later, a werewolf's only a D four. Evidently, <laughs> skeletons are just just a shit ton more unsettling. Than Have you been to a uh, to an anatomy class? That is a pretty I, scary class. So you know, maybe I don't, I don't, I don't know. I, I it, it's part of the the area where I feel that because um, because mythos is also very specifically the mythos. True. Yeah. This, and. Is it can wide range, yeah. I, I so, was, you know, putting it out there as food for thought. No, I, I think it is because if if I was going to, let's say, do a uh, a game where we were just hunting supernatural things, and I was mm-hmm. just going to use Call of Cthulhu uh, as the as the rule set, but I was like, okay, guys, this is what we're going to do. It's actually going to be the uh, the the was it the dark dark world that universal wanted to do is it shared universe where it was like you know the mummy and dracula and right the wolf yes. and all that yeah yeah if, yeah if if i wanted to do like a universal dark world uh it's a game and i'm like we're just going to take call of cthulhu and we're going to just remove the mythos from it and we're just going to focus on tom cruise being a mummy or whatnot <laughs> then i would actually do something like that where it's like okay well you're you know, your dark world mythos skill or whatever it is. Right. Yeah. You know, we, we, we would treat the same way um, as a, as, as permanent uh, reduction on your sanity cap. So that, that, that could be done. But I think if you're going to be doing the, the mythos in it, I wouldn't have it uh, permanently reduce San. Yep. But if, if that, if that was going to be the focus instead of the mythos, I would. Uh, but that's also a different way you could take this game and literally just port it into a totally different, but clearly the same game where it's like, right. you know, yeah. You know, back it's... in the nineties, a buddy always wanted to run me through a vampire and I always wanted to play a vampire hunter. And I didn't want to play blade. I wanted to play Whistler because <laughs> well, Whistler to me was just a lot cooler because you know blade was had all his their strengths right they had super strength yeah. they had all this cool healing I mean, he was awesome whistler was this old dude with a gimped up leg who had zero special abilities outside of he was smart and just just tough as nails and tenacious <laughs> yeah and it's like i want to be that guy who's like absolutely outmatched versus these things but he somehow has been doing it for many years at 
yeah, that that movie when he I think a wall explodes, he's standing there with his machine gun. It's like it's one of my favorite intros of it movie history of you catch you motherfuckers at a bad time it just starts laying away so i was always thought he would be great and that's kind of like how call of cthulhu investigators are of like you are absolutely outmatched by these by these monsters you're facing they are they are connected deep into your society they are immortal or stronger faster everything better than you but you're gonna take them out so yeah i i think if you were gonna do that type of game and just use the Call of Cthulhu rule set. Yeah, I absolutely would. Um, yeah, that and I'm totally with you. If I'm running, you know, straight up mythos infested Call of Cthulhu, I would not uh, reduce sanity for having information in your lore vampire skill. But uh, yeah, if you're if it was focused on that type of game, then absolutely. Just uh, yeah, interesting. So as we. Uh, well, we were talking about movies, and uh, I wanted to kind of touch on on those a little bit more because as we're having this conversation, coming soon to a theater near you is The Last Voyage of the Demeter. And I'm so excited for this. Okay, when I first heard about it, yeah, which, which one, I know my Dracula good enough that I, just the title. I was like, wait, is this a Dracula story? Because I, I know that the Demeter. And I was really apprehensive of how could you make this a full movie until I saw the first trailer and be like, oh man, this looks, this looks scary. Yeah. Because you also do have that claustrophobic feel of they're on a ship at the freaking ocean. I mean, it's like you, you can't get away <laughs> from. Nope. It is. It is a locked room mystery right you know they are they are on that boat and they are going to die yeah it's yeah. such a cool concept and with the trailers i love the fact that the dracula in this movie will will be a real monster right he's he's a half man half bat creature you know he doesn't look like a noble you know who's no you know, traveling and, and, and to be fair, if, if I, you know, if I remember what I've, I've heard about from the novel, I don't believe he traveled like that in, in the novel. It, he traveled as cargo and it was smuggled aboard or something like that. Or I don't, th- not smuggled. I think he was paid for, but no one knew that, that it was an actual coffin and didn't realize they were transporting a body. If, if I recall that. Yeah, he was, they were, they were shipping all this, the, the soil, uh, over and the the, the Demeter uh, was just was carrying it was just just the regular cargo and then people aboard started getting sick and dying and then by the time it uh, arrived in England everyone aboard was dead mm-hmm. and, and and you know and and he came out and did did all his stuff but so the Demeter arrived just kind of run up on the beach and they were they were all dead aboard and you know it's. Yeah, it, 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 they were kind of looking as like, well, it might have been like a plague, or it might have been this, because you know the the idea of the the ship where some plague gets on board and everyone's dead by the time they arrive, that that wasn't unheard of. It's just you know the idea that it was a vampire the whole time. Right. I I love I I I consider this a true Victorian England you know English person approach to that situation. A, a ship arrives in port everybody's dead. The cargo hole is filled with basically mail, right? All this stuff is being shipped to an address. And they were like, well, everybody's dead, but the mail must still go through. They still unload the ship and, and deliver all the things to where they were supposed to go. You know? Oh, oh yeah. Well, I mean, you know, come on, honestly, I mean, I, I, I don't want to wait any longer for my Amazon package either. So it's like, no, man, <laughs> I don't care what the problem was during shipping. They all died. Great. I, I need whatever <laughs> stupid thing I bought. Yeah. So, yeah, they understood. <laughs> so funny. Yeah. So, Last Voyage of the Demeter. Really look forward to that. And then, uh, I don't know, not too long ago, I think it was just earlier this year, I found and rewatched the miniseries called The Strain, which is a just a fan it was like three seasons long 
each season I think had, I don't know, 10, 12, I forget how many episodes, but so good. It's, you know, based on the book series by uh, Del Toro and uh, mm-hmm. Chuck Hogan, I think. So awesome. I, I, I like how the vampirism in that is, uh, it's an infection. It's, it's, a, it's a parasite that gets into your bloodstream and changes your DNA, changes, it does physical modifications to your person. And I like the the delivery system for, for biting people. It, they call it a stinger, but it's, you know, like this big tongue apparatus that's like six feet long that they can launch out through their mouth and it has, you know, like another mouth on the end of this big snake that comes out of their mouth and it can grab on and, and latch onto the victims and just start not only drinking blood, but it's also delivering these like worms that are the parasites that go into the people and, and begin the, the metamorphic change. And so they, you know, become more vampires. But there was a lot of cool stuff in oh. that uh, lore wise because, uh, they all had a uh, a hive mind kind of telepathy thing going, which was very interesting. And yeah, you know, that that is actually one of the things. So you have Del Toro who who has done his kind of a very clear spin on it, where like vampires have a hive mind, and they've got all this stuff. And I think that actually does open up the grounds for you know their, your characters might know some folklore if you're doing like a modern day scenario. They've watched Fright Night. Probably, you know, they, 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 they watched Peter Pan, you know, Francis Ford Coppola's Dracula and all that stuff. But the, the actual monsters they're facing are nothing like the vampire Lestat. Uh, they're like, they're like these, uh, they do have the hive mind going on it. And that could still incorporate the unusual and the unexpected because yeah, the, the whole Lovecraft quote of like fear is from fear of the unknown, where ha- you know, having your players, not just their characters, but the players go, oh yeah, I know everything there is to know about vampires, and they're thinking it's going to be Bella Lugosi, and you introduce a hive mind and like a, a weird tongue thing that's got worms or whatever in it that 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 get you infected to change your DNA, you know, that's all of a sudden a very different you know, thing, uh, which, you know, Del Toro did the second blade movie, which I remember at the opening of that, where a uh, vampire is like f- bottom jaw split down the middle. Right. It was like predator. And it was like, you know, the first time you, uh, I was watching that in theaters, it was like this, Whoa, my God, what the, yeah. Cause it was nothing I'd ever seen before. Uh, yeah. Had a lifetime of consuming vampire films. So where uh, a, a keeper could take yeah, like, oh yeah, your characters know whatever lore is just pop culture. That's fine. That's not going to help you. In fact, that might that might hurt you because um, yeah, the the player characters come in with like two sticks they lash together in a cross or, or something like that, <laughs> and they're, they're, they're confident that the, the holy water will work, yeah. um, or looking for reflections or, or whatnot. And and that is one of the things I think keepers needed too is there is so much vampire lore is determine which of it is actually true absolutely yes i you know if a keeper is going to include vampires they should beforehand make that bullet list of what lore applies what is applicable and, and true for these vampires what is not true what is false information Or how is what, you know, you might initially think of as false information. How is that actually interpreted, you know, for these creatures, right? Um, So maybe, maybe the creatures uh, don't have a reflection. Okay. Or, or maybe the lore is that they don't have a reflection, but under certain conditions, you know, they do have a reflection. I don't know. I'm just kind of throwing that one out there. Well, because there's, yeah, there's one where it's like they have a reflection, but they abhor their own reflection mm-hmm. because yeah, they see what they've become. Or they have a reflection, but the reflection is, you know, what the monster is. 
Yeah, right. Like, yeah, yeah, kind of a Dorian Gray thing, right? You get to see its true self. Like, yeah, that that sees through the 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 uh, you know illusion, the glamour that they've put around themselves, uh, or maybe they just do cast reflections like normal. And it it, it was so the, the Call of Cthulhu Malus um, Mastor you know, kind of lists a lot of you know options because you know a keeper should you know figure out which ones their particular vampire is going to have and which ones they're not. And you know, it kind of goes through a few of them. And one of the things that get brought up, like drinking blood, you know, does, does your vampire drink blood? And it, it suggested that it be uh, points of pal, which is like your, your life force for the living. And I'm going to, I'm actually going to put a disagreement there that a vampire doesn't drink your pal. Because power is your like willpower, right? I would say it was either strength or con, and yeah, it's kind of like you know Lucy in and and Dracula, where she gets bedridden and weaker and weaker and weaker because you know that's your, you know that's your your, your it's kind of like your hit points. All that is is going down, and it might take a while for that to replenish. But you know your your blood is going down, so it's not hit points damage. It's it's actual hit points because you're you're becoming so physically weak as this thing is returning every night, you know, taking four, you know, you know, however many points of gone it is that it needs. And then uh, after so many days, you probably get so low that you do die. But I think that's a lot cooler than just being pal, because it you know, like your your character is becoming less capable. Because of all the stuff that's based off of your stats. And just having the stat loss be from con or strength, it conveys a mental image of the frailty that the victim is going through, much more so, I would think, than a loss of pow. That feels oh, yeah, like a more of a, a spiritual or mental kind of deficiency. Whereas the vampire is sapping your physical strength. Yeah. And then, you know, it's like they're, they're, they're pale. They're getting that withdrawn look, you know, their, their, their hair begins getting brittle and thin, and, you know, just that they're, they're withering away as this thing is coming back over and over again. So that's, you know, that's one way I would change that. And it brings up the idea of, the holy symbol, you know, if, you know, I'm going to hold my two sticks together and make my cross or, or whatever. And it interprets it as this is where pow comes in. And it's not, the symbol doesn't necessarily mean anything to the vampire. I mean, maybe, maybe it did if that symbol meant something to it during life, uh, but it's actually the focus of, of a pow check of the, the, the player character repulsing it away with like, you know, make a hard pow. Yeah, but this, this symbol is what you're focusing through. I, I do like that. Not necessarily for all vampires. Like I, I think, I think, I think there should be different types, but I think is the idea of like the, the holy symbol. It's not the symbol itself. It is the, 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 the pow check from that, that character. Yeah. It's, it's the, you know, the humans who are fighting these monsters underestimate their own innate psychic powers that they're inflicting on the on the vampire right it's a psychic attack when you're presenting your convictions in in a symbol of faith and using that as as a defense or weapon against this undead creature and the creature feels it the creature feels that conviction that strength of faith coming off of the person not not necessarily because of the trinket they hold but it's that conviction that they're presenting you know one one of the bullets that's in the uh malice Mastorum says uh, a vampire is only affected by the religion cult or slash cultural beliefs that it practiced or understood while alive and i think that i i, I would not use that particular bullet in uh in vampire monsters in my game because i think that kind of dismisses well if the vampire was 
when human, a Christian, it's only affected by Christian faith. I think that, you know, diminishes, you know, that kind of psychic power that other faiths have, you know, the followers of the other faiths have. And so I would not limit a vampire to only being affected by whatever kind of holy symbols that they worshiped when they were human. Oh yeah. I mean, it's, it's like, you know, it's like, well, you know, sorry, you, you, you have a, 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 a Hindu vampire. It doesn't care about your cross or, you know, like, well, this vampire was an atheist while they were alive. I mean, like, you know, right. maybe next time you'll get like a really devout Catholic, but you know, but I don't, I prefer it being a pouch check and not having really anything to do with the, the symbol or it itself or what the vampire was like during life. I think that's just, you know, it's just me. Yeah, I agree. And there's, there, there's so many rules that we could go into, you know, like I love, this was one of the rules that was portrayed in the uh, Salem's lot miniseries. It was also a rule that was used in the book. Stephen King used in his book is the, uh, the invitation that vampires could not cross a threshold without an invitation. Oh yeah. And that invitation, that invitation extended even from life. So there was a character in uh, the book who, you know, one of his, he wasn't really a friend, but he was, he was a townsperson who was in trouble and in need. And so this, this one character said, Hey, come to my home. You don't have any place to stay right now. Come to my home. Let me care for you. You know, you're sick. Let me care for you. And, uh, and so the, uh, the character, you know, the victim while still alive, but dying came into this home was uh, sleeping in one of the rooms. And that was the night where the, the vampire that had been feeding on him came for the last time, fed on him for the last time. And then, and then that person died. Well, the very next day, because in the in the Salem's lot, they turn quickly and in a matter of hours. The very next day, because he, he had that invitation when he was alive, he had entry. He had rights to go into that house now as a vampire. Mm. And so then the guy was like, I revoke my invitation. And that was enough. That was enough. And so with the, the, the revocation of that invitation, the vampire had to, had to exit, went out the window. It was a second story window and they were like, did he fall? And they looked down and there's, you know, no evidence of him hitting the ground, you know, and like, Oh my God, where did he go? If he went out the window and, but it was interesting that that was an important part for in the book and portrayed in the, in the shows about invitations. And you can make that, yeah, you know, something like an opposed pow check, mm-hmm. where like you know you're 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 revoking your invitation. It's like well, you got to make an opposed pow because it's already here to uh, to, to 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 banish it from your house, or yeah, you know, it if the, the investigators are searching a series of murders, you know, and they 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 think there might be that vampire angle. You could have like they all take place at houses that have a welcome mat <laughs> for the <their> door. <laughs> That's good. I like that. Yeah, just just bitches like you step over the, the 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 nice you know pretty welcome mat with welcome written in blue on it, and this whole family and they've been bled out. You know what could it be? Uh, so <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> but yeah, if you you could you could you could do that, or it could also be like maybe that's something that you know the vampires themselves spread. And there's the idea of the parent monster. You know, if, you know, the idea that, you know, vampirism is a kind of a, a you know, multi-level marketing thing. And until they have been, you know, until they've made their first kill or until the first full month has passed or, or whatnot, the, uh, the, the children of the parent vampire can be cured from it. Uh, you know, if you kill the master vampire, all the not fully transformed slave vampires are, are cured or maybe it just means that they're now fully for vampires that go fleeing off to become their own masters because they're no longer bound. And you know, that, that would add a 
the ticking time clock, which a lot of movies use. They also use that in the Lost Boys and uh, you know some of the Dracula interpretations, where it's like we got to take out the 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 head in order to save so and so, and that becomes the ticking clock uh, because you know that's how we get to you know save our good uh, our good old friends that our investigators know, or what are the other PCs or you know, the PCs themselves? Right. Yeah. A PC has fallen victim to a uh, to one of the vampires, and now you know you have to you have to get to the the one that created him, or else that's the only way to save you know the the, the person who's been turned. And one of the things which Anne Rice had had brought up in in her you know vampire series was that the vampires always look the same as they did when they died. So if you had you know, a beard or your cleats shaven, you just are forever. If your hair was long, it's just that way forever. You know, which, you know, thank God I didn't get turned into one during my, you know, misguided, you know, <laughs> goatee phase in the late nineties. And, you know, but the, but there's that the idea of like, you know, that the ultimate tragedy of them is that the world keeps moving and they have immortality, but they're kind of locked in this look. And, one of the characters in those stories, he was he was actually turned into one during the Roman era, but as part of the ceremony. And before they, he was transformed, like his captors, because he had been kidnapped, like came in and they shaved him and they did all this stuff. And they they groomed him, and then he was turned into a vampire because that's what he looked like forever. And yeah, you know, that's that's a cool twist, and it, it reminds me in your adventure that that your own interpretation of consume likeness mm. that you did in Transatlantic Terror. Mm-hmm. You did that with the serpent people that yeah. they had outdated hairstyles. Yeah, and, I, I liked that idea of, of being time locked. And I had never re- read, I, I, that was actually one of the first times I really ever paid attention to the consume likeness spells. I ran that adventure. And so I just actually always thought that's how consume likeness was <laughs> for the longest time until, you know, it's like, well, nobody else mentions this. And then you had bitches like, well, I came up with it. Like, Oh, well, that's just how I've always seen it since is <laughs> you know, Yeah, which yeah, thank God. Yeah, you you, you like the, the server person they, they could assume the likeness of somebody that's got like a really dated haircut or a really bad haircut. And you say, Well, sorry, you're just you're just stuck like that forever. Uh, or at least that that particular likeness is. If you want to update hairstyles, you have to you have to consume somebody else with a with a better hair. Yep. So, but you know, you know, that's another thing. Like, if your vampire, you know, can can they change their appearance? Because uh, in Anne Rice, you know, Claudia cuts off her hair in a moment of rage and it grows back like a minute later because that is what she looked like when she died. And yeah, you know, that's you know, that's a cool way uh, keepers could bring that up. Is you know, the 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 vampire has just. Yeah, they've got they had big old mutton chops because they're from the seventies. <laughs> yes, and, yes, I like that. I like that a lot. Yeah, I, actually, just kind of going back to that uh, consume likeness spell. I was reading the spell, and it, it's a ritual. It takes days for that oh, spell yeah. to. And so I interpreted it as because I was thinking about how in real life, you know, snakes will eat prey whole, and it takes days for the digestion to work and you know it's not like snakes have to eat every day they eat whatever you know every so often and then whatever nourishment they take in carries them for for days and days and days and so in yeah in my interpretation of that the you know the serpent person consumes eats the entire victim that they're gonna you know start mimicking but in the process of the days for that ritual to be finished they just lie basically dormant on the floor with this huge distended belly as their victim is being digested inside and then finally as it finishes the digestion the you know now the new likeness comes upon them and they can they can exit and 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 be that new man or or woman so well and and i said that adventure was really well, the first times I really paid attention, and I was in the middle of running the two-headed serpent, which is a- about serpent people. When I inserted that 
kind of in the middle of the campaign. And that's just been canon to how consume likeness has worked for me, including like, oh yeah, it takes like, you know, three days that they're, you know, they have distended their jaw and they're consuming this, this person. And a person, a, a player character could learn this spell. And it's like, well, part of that spell is the player character's jaw like unhinges and they have to, you know, slowly swallow a full size person. That's the same size as them. And <laughs> yeah, that it you know, go through this. It's just this horrifically grotesque process of what what that means because it does take several days. And we did have a player character that that used it in the game. And I had, you know, I had them point out that they were trimming their hair and everything beforehand because that was just, you know, well, you're stuck with this until you get a new body. But that was, uh, that's just how I've always saw I thought it was canon and then find out that, nope, that's a hookism. So, <laughs> well, which I, is weird. I just made up. <laughs> I, I, I like that word. I like that word. I'm glad I could add to your, uh, to your canon. So very cool. Yeah, so vampires just have so much cool stuff about them. And it's such a hodgepodge, you know, can they shapeshift, right? Can they become mist or a wolf or either an actual bat or some kind of half human, bat. half bat creature, right? I mean, oh, it's just so much. Well, and... You know, I, I I personally th- think that if, you know, especially if you're going to have a, a keeper who is going to basically take Call of Cthulhu and and port that into, you know, we're going to spend most of our time on these kind of classic monsters, where instead of just choosing that, you could choose the different types of vampires, where it's like uh, kind of like how how the the you know, World of Darkness Vampire the Masquerade game gave it where like, you know, there was, you know, the Nosferatu and the Vinshu and the Bruja, et cetera, et cetera. But you could make it to where these have reflections. These do not. These have to be invited in. These do not. All of them are affected by this or none of them are affected by this. It, it kind of choose different types at part of what the vampire lore skill versus just an education of pop culture is being able to identify what type of a vampire there is that you're dealing with, as well as what specifically actually does work and what's just folklore or legend or just confusing all the the different types. Uh, So with that way, you could come up with a dozen different varieties that are all technically vampires, but are completely different things. Well, and we've done a little bit of research and mankind has thought about vampires from every walk of life. Every part of the globe has their version of vampires. Uh, And so just a few that we've uh, picked up. Let's see here. Well, in the Philippines... Are the Aswangs, right? Is that how you say yeah. that? Um, and well, what's, I, I what's interesting about them? Oswang. Um, so Oswangs are, uh, they can fly. They have these exceptionally long tongues. And what, they, what they're what most often blamed for is, uh, is miscarriages to where they, they could sit outside a keyhole or a, under a door and have their tongue go through and eat the child out of the mother while she is asleep. Oh, uh, it's, it's, my God. It, oh, I, it's horrific. Uh, but they, they might have like this 15 foot long, like yeah, serpent like tongue that comes uh, slithering out. And I, okay, this is one where he, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, Cause I used Oswangs in uh, my Valdican novels and at that i brought up that they ate livers as well their victim's liver 
but I can't remember if I got that from my research or I made that part up. Um, mm. but I, uh, for some reason, I, th- I think they also ate the livers, but I might have just made that up for the book and f- forgotten if I made that up or not. But the, uh, the fact that they were blamed for, for miscarriages with these freakish tongues that could go through keyholes. Uh, so they're, you know, which means they had to be really slender. Right? Um, yeah. You know, well, the, well, the, you know, mothers to be were, were sleeping horrifically uh, twisted. But when, when people are categorizing vampire lore from around the world, also ones from the Philippines are a very popular one. And, uh, there are uh, a lot of stories about them, and they're still very much in uh, Filipino culture. Because mm. I, I had, I had people reach out to me when they when they read that novel, and like, my God, somebody actually brought up Oswag, so they would talk about they 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 were the 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 bogeyman when they were you know in the Philippines. Oh wow, so, wow, that is very cool. Wow, oh. and that we also uh, recalled and and looked up the, uh, and I'm gonna murder the name of this but penangalan from malaysia penangalan yeah penangalan and that's that disembodied head usually uh, i think it was almost always uh described as a woman's head uh but the disembodied head but it was also trailing the internal organs and 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 its guts and just the viscera and and it could fly I think it had wings or maybe it's hair became wings, uh, but it's, it's vampiric, right? It drinks blood. It has the vampire teeth and it just, it flies through the night. There's a, there's a version of that as well. That is uh, supposedly uh, just for, for doing also the miscarriages kind of thing. So, which is, that must be a real horror trope in, in Eastern culture. Well, it, it's it, 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 with, with, Pen and gallons. I think we have. I think we have mispronounced it a new and exciting way every single time we've attempted to say this. Every time. But you know, the first time I was, you know, I was ever exposed to that was like the old AD and D fiend folio, mm-hmm. where like they had the the picture of the the woman's head, and you know she's got the the vampire teeth, but then like all of her, her her guts are just hanging, you know, from from her neck, and it was. Uh, this this grotesque thing and it was many 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 years before i found out that that was just a a, a real folklore monster that they had you know lifted and and and, and gamified which i thought they were geniuses because man that is that is crazy weird but you know that's you know the malaysian one also uh women which yeah i, I one of the things with the oswegs at the Penagallans, uh, they're they're women, but with the how we've kind of interpreted with vampires, with like thanks to Bram Stoker and all that, they're you know Dracula was a male, kind of mm-hmm. a, a different thing. And then in ancient Babylonia and Assyria, there was Lilitu, Lilitu which was a, a, a type of uh, vampire demon and possibly linked to some of the uh, original lore uh, surrounding Lilith, which uh, Lilith was also then, you know, done in different interpretations as the first vampire in other folklores or more modern folklores, I guess. So that's, you know, you know ancient Babylonia had their own type. Once again, also, also a woman that's wow. I'd never really thought about this. <laughs> Yeah, that's really interesting, actually. So, yeah, there is so many vampires. Oh, and types oh God, of when you go into Wikipedia, it's it's absolutely loaded with as you start going into like vampires from around the world or you know different things. There are different interpretations, and you know, once again, I think a, a, a keeper could kind of go through those and either choose like this is the type it is, or just say like oh no, no they're all just vampires but they're actually more like these which is nothing like you know the dracula movies you were raised on and you know it's it's head you know severs from its body and its guts are hanging there and it's just flying away and <laughs> your players might be a little surprised when if that that it didn't turn into a bat you know 
I, I, I don't know. I always personally liked the old Nosferatu, the Count Orloff style, the yeah. bald, extra long fingers, uh, which um, the Shadows of the Vampire. Yeah, than that, I, I've I've always loved that look because it is monstrous, but at the same time subtle. So mm-hmm. I, I always like the bald vampire. And you'll get that in the uh, new film, uh, Last Voyage of Demeter. No. So I was going to say, you know, the uh, one of the key things with vampires is always the the specific ritualistic method in order to destroy vampire you must do this or you must do that to kill a vampire which coincidentally enough you do that to a human and they will die as well but what are your thoughts yeah weird right (laughs) what are your thoughts on uh we are the vampires all along (laughs) right (laughs) the call is coming from inside the house (laughs) What are your thoughts on the uh, the rituals that are needed to uh, destroy a vampire, and and are those also up for reinterpretation? Oh, absolutely, they should be up for reinterpretation. Uh, one thing that I've always refers like you know, the, there's the idea of the stake through the heart, and you know, I I prefer the idea, the stake isn't it's not impaling the heart. You're literally staking the thing down to the ground is one of the interpretations that I've always preferred. It's the idea of, like, you know, yeah, I, I shoot it with a crossbow and you appeal its heart and it dies. Like, no, no, that's not what does it. It's the actual, you're staking it to something, uh, which I you know, like usually open up its coffin. And you're literally, it, it can't get up. You staked it down like you staked down a tent. And that allows you to then go through the process of, you know, cutting off its head or, or actually fully removing its heart or whatnot. So, I, I prefer that interpretation of staking myself. I and like that because I think I, I have always, well, like in Lost Boys, don't they, at one point, isn't a crossbow used to destroy a vampire because the wooden shaft of the of the crossbow bolt went through his heart? I would stake him to like a stereo and then the stereo turned on a sparks from wherever you're at. Right, like, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I, I like that idea of, of actually staking them to the ground because i i guess in my head i i was just thinking of it you know stake piercing heart you know puncturing it you know which seems less intrusive puncturing but yeah the heart pumps the blood yeah that makes sense staking it all the way through and through the back and so you've anchored it to the ground that is horrific and gruesome and absolutely perfect for oh, destroying because, a vampire. I love it. Because there's the idea of like, it, you know, it, it wakes up with the process, but now it's like a, a, a bug that's been literally pinned down and it's, it's arms and legs are, are, are moving and its eyes are rolling toward you, but it just can't, you know, pull itself out because it has been you know, staked to the ground. Uh, yeah. That's, I don't know. That, I, I think that's absolutely horrifically scary looking to to picture it writhing and still not dying, just never being able to move. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you know, of course, there's uh, the idea of you know, garlic. Yeah, you know, does it just repulse them, or does it you know actually injure them? Or you know, running water was was one. A terrible, terrible, god awful movie. Please, under no circumstance should you believe that I I am recommending it. Other than the fact it's got so many great ideas that is worth stealing, is Dracula Two Thousand. Oh, okay. And, uh, I know. I know. I just I just whipped that out on you. Uh, and in that one, it was uh, hanging, is actually what it was because they could they could kill all the the lesser vampires through all the classic means, but. Uh, the, the the concept was is that uh, uh, Van Helsing has never been able to actually kill Dracula. He's got Dracula in this like silver coffin, and he is a prisoner, and he's tried everything, and he can't kill this thing. Uh, and he's basically had Dracula since the 1890s, and it's modern day, and he's actually he's been. Was it putting leeches on Dracula's body to suck Dracula's blood, and then he 
uses a syringe to get the blood out of the leech, and he's injecting it himself, giving himself immortality to keep him alive long enough to finally kill Dracula. Oh um, my god. If you've never seen the movie, um, it's not good, but it's got some cool ideas. And in the end, yeah, you know, spoiler, you had to hang him the whole time. Hmm. Uh, <laughs> but all of the others, they're killing the classic ways. Oh my god, that is that's hilarious. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. If if you've never seen it, you are in for a bad movie with some awesome, awesome ideas. Well, I, also in real folklore, uh, which it, you know, I, I I did some looking up of of real vampire panics that I see. At one night, I didn't see, and I've seen a picture of is a uh, a body that they had found in an old um, old coffin who had a curved scythe blade uh, at its neck. It, the idea was that the vampire could not rise or it would cut its own head off. So that was how they dealt with the, the person never coming back as a vampire. So they have this curved blade literally mounted your pounded her in the coffin right above its neck. And now it can't get up without decapitating itself. But that's how you keep them from returning. That, that's nice. A, that was a real thing, man. Um, <laughs> but that's kind of brings us up to real ways they have dealt with vampires. Uh, that's actually where it, where it gets weird because this is before Hollywood. Real uh, told us how to do. destruction of well, real vampires. Well, tell me know, more. Uh, allegedly, well, the the, the it, there's a, an article I found on the, the the Great New England Vampire Panic. Of 1854, and there there evidently have been multiple vampire panics prior to that. You know, in 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 Europe and in the the United States, of you know, you know, you might have a of a, a various plague or or blight come through, and then it ends up being uh, you know blamed on the different types of vampires. So there were lots of cases where they would come in and uh, exhume corpses uh, yeah. just in different parts of New England and where they would you know, they have the whole town come out. And for some reason, they would do it at night, which, God, nobody thinks about doing this during the daylight. But <laughs> uh, yeah, so it, there was talking about they will they'll find bodies in old cemeteries who have had, you know, their you know, the blade across the neck where their ribs shattered because they would cut out the hearts and uh, burn them because burning the hearts was a, a popular way of dealing with them or the scrambling up the bones and putting the, uh, the femurs across the chest as a, as a, as a different way of doing it. And but the, the most recent one I found, and this was, uh, this one was kind of weird was mercy Brown who was in Exeter, Rhode Island. And in 1892, which was not that long ago, uh, when we think about, you know, you know, people going out and cut, exhuming vampires, mm -hmm. um, she passed after several members of her family had. So two months after her burial and her, her, uh, her brother had gotten very ill. They said that she's the vampire. So they went out in 1892 they uh, dug her up. They talked about her skin looked fresh and pure, which is just all part of the decomposition process. They removed her heart and they burned it. And then they mixed the ashes into this medicinal potion that they then gave to her brother to drink, to, oh, to heal him. Or it's like, like you, you, you consume the vampire that had been consuming you. Um, he, he, he died anyway, two months later, but you know, this was, yeah, this is right before the 20th century, the 1890s, and we have uh, people in uh, uh, in Rhode Island going out and digging up corpses, thinking they're vampires. So it's, it's not like it's 130 years ago. Yeah, that is not that long. No. Oh no, that, it, it, my god! That it, yeah, I I know, right? <laughs> because he always pictured it's like. Well, it'd be like like you know the the you know, way back in the 1600s, like no man, 
Wow. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Insane. Insane. You know, it's so funny also because in modern day, there there's a whole group of people, a, a subculture who thrive and love, you know, anything that's, you know, dark and moody and, you know, very much of part of that vampire kind of uh, culture. And we call them goths, right? You've got your your goth subculture and they're into, you know, the death metal and the, you know, it's a whole music thing and it's a whole, you know, the death metal. <laughs> the death metal. No, I Those don't, I don't. kids... I know nothing about this, John. I don't know what you're talking oh, about. Oh, I'm sure there are incriminating photos somewhere. Oh, yeah, a, quite a bit. Of a pale-faced <laughs> Seth Skorkowski. I'm always pale-faced, man. <laughs> um, no, uh, yeah, man, I was, I, was a, I was a teenager in the 90s, so yeah, I, I'm, I'm pretty familiar with, uh, with all that. I used to go to the, the goth clubs and you know, listen to Sisters of Mercy and uh, whatnot. There actually used to be a, a fantastic one. It finally actually closed during the pandemic in Dallas called The Church that was open on Sunday and Thursday nights. And it was is actually evidently one of the best goth clubs in the world. I had not known that at the time. And there in the 90s, there was a Vampire the Masquerade LARP going on that very regularly would have 40 or so players who were LARPing vampire while the club was open. So if, if you knew what to look for, you could, you could watch them, you know, you go into the quarters and have like, you know, whatever their political dramas were. And when they did battle, they did it through rock, paper, scissors. So you could sit there and, and they, a lot of it would dress to the nines of whatever type of, of, of clan they were. And you can see them just tuck off of the quarters to do quick rounds of rock, paper, scissors. So they had uh, multiple storytellers because, you know, like how do you, how do you, how do you GM 40 people in right. a nightclub that's got several <laughs> hundred people in it already and all, all the music and, and you know, there's multiple dance floors and all this stuff. Like you, one person can't do it. So they actually had a team of storytellers that would like, like, have to be called in to make certain judgments or, or witness, um, you know, certain exchanges or whatnot that were kind of like buzzing around like this little team. I, I never played it. It part of what is is something like that big is kind of intimidating, uh-huh. but it, I was always fascinated watching it and kind of hearing about it, you know, like, like a second hand of what all the, you know, whatever dramas were is like, there was a battle for the new Prince and, and all that. And they were, of course, yeah, everybody looked like they just came right off the set of the crow. So. <laughs> right. Yes. Yeah. It's I. I've only had a brief passing view of uh, some vampire larpers. This was not long after I got out of the army. I was living in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and a friend of mine and I drove to Biloxi, Mississippi, to go to a. Uh, comic book gaming convention thing going on there. I wish I could remember what it was called, but as we were pulling nerd. up nerd, big time nerd, as we were pulling <laughs> up into Biloxi and we're going to the convention center, I look over and I see this group of people and they're dressed in black. And I mean, they looked like they had come out of the, the crow movie and they're running up this like service ramp and they're, you know, going, I don't know. So part of like a, like a, like a loading dock or something behind this one building. And I turned to my friend and I pointed it out to him. I go, what are, what are those guys doing? And he just looked at him and he goes, and he just kind of nodded and he goes, yeah, the, they're playing vampire. They're, they're LARPing. And I'm like, I don't know all, whatever you just said, I know it was English, but it, it meant <laughs> nothing to me. Everything you said just meant nothing. I, I don't understand a thing. And so he had to tell me all about it. I was like, oh, okay. And that was the only time I've ever actually seen anyone play. Here in Kansas City, there's a, a, some popular conventions and there's some LARPers, but they're playing a game, uh, Rokugan, something of, something about Rokugan, uh, which I I understand to be a, like, a, like a Japanese or an Asian culture kind of game. So it's not Vampire the Masquerade, 
LARP, but that's the only other LARP that I've ever seen uh, people play, sometimes well, to, to, to terrible ends, unfortunately. Well, one of the things that I always I always thought was cool um, around that time I said I never I never got into it, but the, the there were pins of the different clans, and people would just wear their pins like around town, and that was like yeah, because yeah you know, you know he, this was also before you know the internet really became commonplace. And there's always the question of like you know how do you find people to play with? Well. Yeah, the 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 very part of the best grade larpers had had the greatest method of all time, and that is wearing a freaking pin when you you go out and about to the bookstore and, and whatnot, and somebody looks at you and it's like, oh, you're you're Bruja? like, oh yeah, you play? How do I get in? And <laughs> nice, yeah, uh, just 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 a nice little way without wearing a giant shirt of like you know. Would you like to LARP? Ask me how. No, it was kind of like, <laughs> if you know, you know. <laughs> oh my God. That's awesome. Yeah. I, I'm excited to, to put vampires, put more vampires or, or vampire like creatures into my games. I think that'd be a lot of fun. Well, in my, um, my own sequel that I did to the haunting was a, uh, it was a, it was a vampire story. And I had a, uh, you know, instead of the 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 vampire nightclub, like you would see in in Blade or you know lots of other stuff like that, I had it be a speakeasy that was an old. Uh, it was underground, and there was a uh, like an auto shop that had like kind of the the busted up car that was in one of the bays. It was like an old converted barn sort of thing, like in the middle of Boston. But at night, they would like push it out of the way and there's a trap door under it. And it led to these like spiral stone stairs to where there was like this underground church. But on the level below that was uh, the big symbol that looked like the, uh, the eye with the triangle with the three Y's made out of it that you saw right. from the haunting. Yeah. And those were where they would kill the victim. And those were the blood grooves that would carry the blood to the three vampires that were actually under the place and it was their feeding ground. So like those would go along these kind of metal lined troughs on the lowest level that carry the blood to these wow. like, tubes that were directly above the sleeping vampire's mouth. So as they slept, it would drip blood in their mouth through this thing. And it was the eye, but there were like spikes on it. They'd throw people down in a pit and they'd be impaled. The blood would run have, down. Have you um, published this? No, uh, this was just something I did to my players. And that oh, it, man. And, and that was that one began with a uh, it was the murder of a vampire hunter, a known vampire hunter, it is found like floating in Boston Harbor, and the uh, investigators are trying to piece together what happened to this guy, and that's how they found the the speakeasy because they found his old hotel and some of his own notes, and they pieced it together, and they found this vampire nest, but it's like ah, but they're the same ones as that Corbett guy that you dealt with in the haunting you know two years ago or whatnot that is awesome please if you've got your notes write that up and self-publish it on the repository i stumble across them every once in a while i my, my full glorious map that i kind of like sketched out of like some graph paper with like a big pen you know so it's it's probably illegible to any human being. That's not me, but, but yeah, I always know what, what it is because I see on one of the floors is just that big eye symbol that leads off to these three little chambers. And it's like, Oh yeah, I know what that is. That's my oh, man. Yes. I want to see this. I want to run this. That is awesome. Yeah. They, they researched where the, uh, the, the building was that was like the auto repair shop. And it was, you know, long, long ago before the one from the haunting was the, that same church that was burned down in the haunting that they go visit. And it's just like, Oh, it was like, you know, a different, a different one of those, but older. And the, uh, the, the one for the haunting was kind of like one of their satellite churches that had sprung up. So, yeah. And so I've, I always kind of treated uh, the, the Corbett monster as uh, a vampire and, 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 and my call of Cthulhu games. Man, that is canon now for me too. Oh my god, that's such a great <laughs> idea! And you've done more with vampires, even in your books, haven't you? Um, yeah. Uh, so in uh, 
in my Valdican series, uh, which I, I pulled in a lot of monsters from various folklores and, you know, I had, you know, I had Oswangs and, and various, uh, things that kind of get umbrellaed under vampires, but I did have classic vampires, but they were, instead of it being a disease or a virus or anything, it was a demonic possession. And if you use silver or staked a vampire or whatnot, all you did was you killed the body and the demon, the actual vampire would just flee to the body of another person it had marked. And that, so the only way to kill it was with these special weapons. But with vampires, I had it be that when they fled to a new body, if the person that they had marked was still alive, that's when they, the vampire looked like it was a, a living person and it, you know, kind of the, the Count Dracula look. But if the person had died within like kind of a, whatever window it was, and the, the demon then went to the, uh, the marked body who is now dead, that's when it became the, uh, the bald, pointed-eared, spidery-fingered uh, Nosferatu type. So that it was like, it's, is cool. So it's just basically the the only difference between them really came down to what was the condition of the body when the demon turned it into a true vampire. And that way I could have two totally different types that were still technically the same thing. That is so cool. So the the vampires are calling dibs on people. And if they're still alive, they become a, a pretty vampire. And if that, you know, the body was dead then they're the ugly vampire. That's yeah. freaking awesome. I love that. So it's kind of, kind of the idea is if the, if the, if the demon bites you, it's, it marks you and that, and the spirit could move to you anytime it wants. Vampires also had uh, death. won't even save you. They'll still take you after that. So mm. I, I was how my, my Valdican series handled them, which, cause yeah, I always, like I said, I always loved the, uh, the old Nosferatu look. And I like the idea of the, the vampires having basically fingers that have two extra joints of, of length and flexibility, because that's horrifically creepy to me. <laughs> <laughs> it is. Yes. <laughs> it, that is horrifically creepy. One other thing that I actually do want to bring up before we wrap this all up is if you ever get a chance, there is a book by a gentleman named uh, Christopher Buhlman, who actually originally met through the Ren Faire circuit as Christoph the Insulter, but he has my favorite vampire novel, um, and it is called The Lesser Dead. And it is it is set in the 1970s in New York City, and it is from the point of view of a vampire who was 15 or 16. Uh, when he was converted and they're living in the sewers under 1970s, New York. And it is a wonderful, wonderful horror novel because you know, you are following him, but they are still very inhuman monsters, but he's a lot of really cool interpretations of it. So I'll always, always give a shout out to that novel and the audio book, Christoph, who he is a, he is a professional actor. I usually kind of frown at the idea when authors try to read their own books because you know, like I'm not a, I'm not a trained voice actor. Uh, I can't do it as well as my narrator did. He is a trained actor. And so he, his readings are actually my favorite author readings of novels ever. Oh, um, cool. So, so when he did the lesser dead, it was brilliant. So well, then maybe I will get it as an audiobook. I just tagged it on Amazon to get the Kindle, but maybe I'll do it as an audio. Okay. There is a spinoff prequel sort of thing he did called the suicide motor club that takes place in the same world. And it's like in the sixties and it is uh, you got vampires running around in cars. Uh, but it's, it's not a sequel or a direct prequel. Like there's a character in it that is referenced at the lesser dead. And you won't, you won't even notice when you read the second one, unless you go back and read it. It's like, Oh, Hey, it's that character they mention in passing. And then a few years later, he wrote a book that cast this one character that was a throwaway line. And uh, I always liked that. So that's it cool. makes the world bigger. Yeah, I, that's one of the things I liked in uh, the vampire movie with um, the aliens people, right? It had uh, uh, Bill Paxton and um, it had... Uh, oh, 
I just near talked dark? about it earlier. Near Dark. I don't know why the, the name just flew out of my head like a bat. Well, yes. Yeah, so I had the same thing because it was like they're running around in the desert in a car. Like I was about to say, like, um, uh, crap, I can't name that movie. because. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, Near Dark, they would uh, spray paint the windows or put foil on the windows of their cars and vans uh, in order to be able to drive during the day. Uh, without burning up, you know, without bursting into flames and stuff. I always thought that was kind of cool. I, you know, and I think you know, Bill Paxton in that is also like the most iconically terrifying mutilated vampire ever. But I also love the fact like that that came out like they pretty much just left the set of Alien. <laughs> yeah. Alien. Yep. <laughs> and, just, and 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 so made you that, you and, and you uh, you're in a vampire movie now. Come on. And uh, no, it's and there was a, another film I have seen that sh- I actually saw years before Near Dark. Uh, so I thought it was so original that had the same concept of the vampires in the desert in using cars and they're sleeping in the street. And it was so awful. And uh, my, my goth girlfriend and I went to go see that in like 2001. And all I remember is we just laughed our butts off. But <laughs> Near Dark, much, much better version. <laughs> much better. Yes. But anyways, I will always give a shout out to uh, Christopher Buhlman's um, Lesser Dead, 1970s New York Vampires. Fantastic story. It's one, uh, of, my, it's one of my very favorite audio books. I will check it out. And I think I will do an audio. I, in fact, uh, we're about to have a new month. I think I'll have a new uh, credit f- got some, uh, for audio. Got, so. some, got some credits coming. Got some credits. Going to start spending them again. Awesome. <laughs> This was cool. I like vampires. We need to uh, we need to include vampires more often in our games. I think. Well, yeah. It's the thing is, you know, maybe, maybe we'll come back and we can cover some of the other classics, like you know, werewolves and you know, mummies, all, all the other fun ones. Oh Cause, yeah, know, like because Brenda Fraser's mummy is also to be like like people are like what's Pulp Cthulhu? Watch the mummy. <laughs> yes. <laughs> You want that? That's Pope Cthulhu. So, yep, two guns and everything. Oh, it's, it's strapping the extra PCs to the wings. You know, just just the most. Just, yeah, everything. <laughs> well, if you like hearing us and want to hear more uh, and and get some exclusive content like the exclusive games that we're running with our patrons, please consider joining our Patreon. Uh, we'll have a link in the show notes. It's patreon.com forward slash modern mythos. And we cannot do this show alone. I'd like to thank our amazing editors, uh, Max Mahoffa and Edward Nagy, and doing all the hard work and making us sound awesome. Also cutting thank down on all the times John and I stare at each other through the video conference, completely bewildered of what we're trying to say. <laughs> the, the death stare of you go next. Oh, oh, no. it, 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 for sometimes I'm like, did it freeze? No, we're just staring. <laughs> we're just staring at each other, kind of lost in each other's eyes. But uh, next, you know, we're coming to remove those. <laughs> right. Dreamily. Uh, we also want to thank John Sumro for our badass logo. He's an incredibly talented artist. So please follow him on Facebook and check out his official website. And please consider joining his Patreon as well. We'll have those links also in the show notes. And finally, we want to thank the darkest of the hillside thickets for generously allowing us to use their song Gluttony as our intro and outro music. If you're a fan of Lovecraft's writing and the Call of Cthulhu role-playing game, then you need to check out the darkest of the hillside thickets. Please check out their band camp site and official band site. Links below in the show notes. Thank you all for listening. Thank you.